Merci beaucoup, uh, Jean-François. Uh, et uh, bonjour à tous. C'est un plaisir d'être ici avec vous, avec vous, Kouikoué, virtuellement. Je regrette que la condition de, me, uh, de mon français signifie que je vous parle aujourd'hui en anglais, mais en tant que nation que plus réputée pour sa côtoise, j'espère que vous me pardonnerez. I'm speaking tonight on Edinburgh's Enlightenment, 1660 to 1750, the French connection. And I'm going to start by talking, by talking a little bit about Scotland in the period 1660 to 1750, because this is a period where Scotland's ancestral links with France are in the end frayed and broken but where they are still strong. And then I'm going to talk about more directly about links between Edinburgh and some of the prominent practices and citizens of Edinburgh with France and in particular Paris. So that's where this is going. I'm going to start you off by showing you a map of Scotland, but not Scotland as quite as we know it. This is a map of Scotland made uh, in England in 1715. And you can see the vision of uh, Highland Scotland, mountainous Scotland is actually much larger on this map indeed, as it is from all perspectives compared to what it is in reality. And you can also see why when it came to supplying uh, rebellious Scots Jacobites, it was much easier for French, the French naval forces to come up the west coast and the east because the mapping of the islands and inlets is so much worse, so much poorer than it is along the east coast. Scotland itself in this period, 1660 to 1750, is of course in a rather strange netherworld between being a, between being a completely independent state as it was in 1603 and being a jurisdiction within a union state, which it was to become after 1707. One of its main problems was its loss of international representation because by a historical accident, it was the crown which appointed ambassadors. And so when James, the, without any parliamentary input, and so when James the sixth and first went down to London, uh, he took with him the power to create ambassadors and because he was in favor of a greater British uh, Union, he, he appointed British ambassadors, which so annoyed the Scottish administration that, is, that in 1630, the Privy Council declined to endorse any international agreements that were not made for England and Scotland jointly or severally, but certainly not for Great Britain. So Scotland's position in this period, and it's a time when it makes its last major con independent contribution to military conflict on the continent with the 60,000 or so Scots who take, who take part in the Thirty Years' War in 1618-48, including a significant number in the French forces, uh, uh, occupies a, a, a position rather like the, the states of the Holy Roman Empire, of having a superioritas territorialis or landus hoheit, a territorial sovereignty, but not actually having very much of an effective foreign policy. So Scots are very, uh, still very prominent in the continent in this period and in continental conflict. There are, for example, 50 Scottish governors in the 17th century Scandinavian lands and in Germany during this period. There's a, but there is a changing relationship with France because uh, there is some sympathy, uh, uh, even for the Covenanters, surprisingly, from Richelieu's government and others in the 1630s because of the ancestral links with Scotland. But already Scotland and France are coming into conflict uh, in other parts of the world. For example, the grant of Nova Scotia to Sir William Alexander in 1621 uh, uh, by the English king, the British king, leads to uh, France being in conflict with the Scots in Nova Scotia and eventually the eviction 
uh, of the uh, Scottish uh, Scottish forces uh, and the uh, by the making of the peace, peace treaty between uh, Great Britain and France under Charles I in 1632. But, but although Scots are not quite so active in the French universities, they remain very active in the Huguenot academies. There are 67 staff members in those academies who are Scots between 1580 and 1680. And there are principals in uh, Scottish principals in all those academies. And that's almost as many as there are French Huguenot staff actually in the, uh, in the academies in the records we have. A number of characteristics which are to become typical of Scots over the centuries to come develop in this period or come to the fore in this period. Um, two of those are the tendency of Scots to be found in frontiers and in frontier commands. And that's particularly true of uh, the Cunningham's governorship of the Finnmark in Sweden and of Scots roles in developing the Russian military and the Russian service. And secondly, because Scotland's economy depends on exporting relatively low value goods uh, and importing a lot of luxury goods, Scots always have a tendency to want to set up as merchants in the, in the, in the uh, ports they're importing from to try and control the terms of trade. That's particularly true at uh, Veer, the Scottish staple in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, but it's also true in Bordeaux. So, we're moving after 1707 into the imperial era and where Scots, the, the British imperial era, where Scots are very successful throughout uh, from a very early stage, driven by the extent of their kinship networks, overlaid by the strongly developed nature of their associational, institutional and educational infrastructure, the high, the, the high level of education in Scotland, uh, there are supposed to be, on, on reckoning, more places in universities per capita in Scotland than anywhere else in Europe in the 18th century. Their experience on frontiers and trade control, uh, as I've just mentioned. And later on, the development uh, of a national external language of Scottishness based around uh, tartan, uh, nostal uh, nostalgia, heroism, military chivalry, and a, and a love for liberty, which is part of the branding of uh, Scottish Romanticism, which is really how Scotland remains seen over the world. But Scotland is not seen over the world particularly clearly from a French perspective in aggregate. I'm sure it is here tonight, of course it is. But uh, the Anholt GFK Roper Global Brands Index, which is commissioned by the Scottish government actually uh, annually, actually suggests that Scotland enjoys the lowest level of brand recognition in France, compared to the 82% of Russians who recognize Scotland as having a distinctive national culture, only 43% of French respondents, actually the lowest figure anywhere, uh, are recognize the, separate, the uh, existence of a Scottish national culture. Of course, this can work in various ways. I was asked a few years ago, in fact, during the first referendum uh, campaign in Scotland to make a program for the Russian Cultural Ministry on the uh, similarities between Scotland and Russia. And there was a lovely interviewer and a lovely cameraman and another person who didn't seem to be doing very much except for looking out of the window. And I can't imagine what he was doing and uh, you can perhaps tell me afterwards. French foreign policy um, for most of this period revolved around this imperial, uh, st uh, breaking up the British imperial state and they often used its, the, their surrogates, the Stuarts, to achieve that end. And of course, just as the Irish brigades fought in the French service at this time, there remained Scottish regiments in the French service, not disbanded until 1763. There were three a peak of three regiments in the mid-late 1740s. A fourth was offered, in fact, to Simon Fraser, the master of Lovett, but he declined and joined the British army. And there is quite a lot of fluidity between Scottish and British military forces at this time. In fact, it was a Captain Macdonald, formerly the Ecossois Royal, who was able to deceive the French sentries at Quebec in 1759, because unsurprisingly, he had very good French. So the Stuart court um, and the imagery surrounding the Stuarts becomes very important, not just for the sake of the dynasty and so forth, but also because for the image of Scots uh, and the 
in Europe generally, the contribution that Scots make to the image of more general liberty. For example, I'll just show you a couple of images from the National Gallery of Scotland in a moment, which are early examples of the Montagnard theme and the association of uh, Scottish uh, chiefs and leaders with liberty. The first is Charles Jervis's painting of John Campbell in 1708. And the second is a French painting, Pierre Paracel's painting of the George Keith, the Earl Marshal in 1716. Charles Edward Stuart, like other Jacobites, appeared, although not um, necessarily it's in his native dress, in On Habit de Montagnard de Corse frequently. And the presence of the Les Montagnards, uh, Les Montagnards uh, of whom there are as many as 2,000 at Toulouse in 1719, was associated with the, with the uh, struggle for what was left of the old alliance, with the division of or the redivision of uh, the British Isles into three kingdoms, which is an objective of French foreign policy and with a struggle for liberty. It wasn't alone in that. Uh, the importance of the Swiss Montagnards was, uh, were, was uh, central to the development of the idea of the Montagnards as a symbol of liberty in the 18th century in France. And so to an extent was that was the example of Corsica. Uh, Rousseau reflected in, on all three, but the Scots were a significant part of that. And when Alexandre de la Rochefoucauld um, toured Scotland in the 1770s, he spoke very much in those terms. The idea of liberty makes them live. So if Scotland didn't uh, uh, enjoy liberty in this period, it enjoyed the reputation of being a country which was the friend of liberty. And on the left is the Jervis portrait of Campbell with, the, with particularly strongly uh, inevit uh, nativist insignia, uh, uh, the, the broadsword and targe, nativist insignia, the mountains in the background and Paracel's George Keith likewise has the mountain fortress, the cliff top fortress of Donotta beside Stonehaven uh, behind him. So very similar, you can see these are very similar in their military composition and the values they seek to ascribe to their subjects. And now from that kind of general uh, tour d'horizon, if I may be permitted a phrase of English, uh, to Edinburgh uh, as it stood in the 1740s, not perhaps as Froissart called it, the Paris of Scotland. Uh, that was a long time before and he was being very kind. Um, but as it stood in 1742, it's the, you can see the clearly, the very strong spine of the main city running from the castle down to Holyrood Palace at the bottom of the Royal Mile and the division into Edinburgh proper and the Cannon Gate, which runs along the transepting, uh, the transepting road here, which uh, uh, between the nether bow and the head of the Cannon Gate, you can just make that out, I should think, on the map. And this is the first full street map done by Edgar. You can see uh, in 17, James Edgar in 1742, you can see the, in, the intense and uh, uh, deep concentration of people in the main city and the larger uh, gardens and so-called Canongate backs along the houses of the Canongate. And here is a not really as it would have looked at the time, but still extant and restored by the city council in Edinburgh to give you a sense of the kind of scale and size of those townhouse gardens around the Canongate where the nobility lived. Well, the capital was, if not the Paris of Scotland, very conscious of the Paris of France. So whereas Paris was one of the first cities to develop a guidebook, the Description Nouvelle of 1684, although there wasn't exactly a guidebook to Edinburgh in the period, a chief places of Edinburgh was published, possibly in response to the Description Nouvelle at, uh, this, uh, at this time, possibly slight, probably about three, or three years later. Um, Edinburgh's infrastructure was developing very rapidly with a provision, first of all, because Edinburgh has the great misfortune uh, or had the great misfortune not to be a city which is near much of a water supply for most of its history. And so that was one of the, the reasons it had a reputation for um, not being particularly clean. But the West Bow water supply, which was instituted in 1681, was followed by uh, the so-called muck men and the uh, establishment of a refuse collection service in the 1680s and 90s. Uh, 
and then later a firefighting service after 1700, like Paris, Edinburgh was prone in its heavily populated areas to large fires. And similarly, Edinburgh followed Paris in developing a sedan, although at some distance of so nearly 50 years, of following a sedan chair rental system, uh, which was introduced in 1639 in Paris and not until uh, the 1680s in Edinburgh. The building, uh, the, the Dean of Guild's courts uh, 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 um, sought a great deal of conformity in Edinburgh building, which is why in both the old town and the new of Edinburgh, there's a great deal of conformity in period building. And I'm not going to compare it with the building regulations of Henri Quatre, but in terms of in terms of developing the cityscape, there are some similarities, and that particular is perhaps um, best seen not in the uh, household plan household planning exactly, but in the nature of the organisation of households, the creation of horizontal stra social stratification which led in Edinburgh in the late 17th century very much, I would say, in a, a style which everyone here can recognize, to the development of whole floors uh, and a different social status attached to different floors in each building for sale. For example, one of the speculative developments at Burnett, Burnett's Close uh, that was a drawing room flat, a flat on the first floor, the best floor to have in Scotland, the premium for a drawing room flat over a third or fourth floor flat, was around about 47% on the market in 1720. Uh, it's about the same in Edinburgh now. I don't know what the, uh, the uh, real estate premiums are in Paris, but I should imagine there are such. There's the drawing room flat in Burnett's Close, which was the prestigious one, had a 5.5 meter dining room, two bedrooms, both about four meters square, a closet and a nine square meter kitchen and pantry. That was a typical uh, prestigious Edinburgh flat of the day, but also the public spaces uh, echoed French practice. Of course, uh, Louis, uh, Louis XIV was following uh, Henri Quatre's Pont Neuf Equestrian Statue of 1614 in much of his iconography. Uh, um, I think it was a, a sign that unruly Paris was finally tamed for the crown, at least for a bit anyway, uh, that Pont Neuf statue. But Grinling Gibbon's copy uh, uh, of the Windsor statue of Charles II was very much, which is outside St. Giles, uh, was very much done in, that st in the style of uh, Louis XIV and Charles, Charles's uh, appro Ch com commissioned approach to architecture uh, echoed that, certainly in terms of, of royal architecture, as we shall see in a moment with Holyrood House. And here, of course, is uh, an Edinburgh close showing something of the immense density of population and uh, a, a lack of privacy in some of the spaces further up the hill from the Cannon Gate. This is, I know, a faint drawing, but it is a favorite of mine. And it is the image of the Cannon Gate, the uh, traditionally the wealthier and more upmarket part of, uh, the, Edinburgh, of the Edinburgh area with its more, where you can see more formally laid out and quite sizable gardens, quite a lot of foliage uh, and a more spacious living than in that close with the unmistakable uh, chateau air of the palace of Holyrood House, uh, initially built about 150 years earlier, but expanded to this size and scale in its development under Charles II as really a royal palace and one which, uh, one which echoed uh, French practice. But on a much more mundane level, um, there was a determination to march in lockstep uh, with, with the major European capitals, Paris and Amsterdam being the particular choices uh, in the regulation and the, uh, and the provision of infrastructure in the city. So although Edinburgh anticipated uh, Paris is, it's a rare anticipation, but it did anticipate Paris's postal system by about 20 years. Paris's three collections a day uh, by the middle of the 17th century put it in the shade. Likewise, in street, street lighting, it's very difficult to tell who was actually first. One might presume Paris was first, they're very close. But whereas Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh's initial solution to street lighting uh, 
was to commit the uh, the owner of the close or the person whom the close was named after was usually the person who has had most social prestige and therefore closes um, Edinburgh little those little Edinburgh streets off the main street were perpetually renamed uh, as a new person bought or to uh, the close or, or the the biggest building in the close and uh, so and their previous owner died so they were they, they were um, meant to put out lanterns for street lighting, but that was paled into significance between the 3,000, uh, before the 3,000 lanterns that were provided in Paris by 1667. Indeed, uh, 80 years later, Edinburgh only had 107 public street lamps. And there were also institutions, uh, uh, because I think it's very important to remember that there remained a great deal of personal and institutional commerce between the two cities and indeed between the two countries. So Scots College at Paris uh, was the college of course for training uh, Catholic priests of predominantly Scottish nationality was not just used as a seminary. It was used as a dead letter office by, uh, that is an office where uh, letters were left to be picked up by third parties to prevent the address, the person to whom the letter was addressed getting into any trouble with the authorities by the Jacobite court. Uh, and its principle, so it became a very important part of Jacobite court administration, the Jacobite court being by now in Rome. And its principal, Alexander Gordon, was among the first members elected to the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. And in that first batch were with Gordon, uh, the engraver Robert Strange, Diderot, the Comte de Buffon, and some of the beneficiaries of that dead letter office, the Scottish history painters at Rome, including Alexander Runciman, whose work was sustained by payments, uh, commissions from which ultimately came from the Jacobite court, which had been siphoned through Alexander Gordon in Paris at Scots College. So we're actually, we're seeing uh, in the creation of some of the learned societies of Scotland open at once to scholars from France, part of that network and connectivity which endured throughout the 18th century. And that's also true when it comes to communications. Uh, we, we can argue, people do argue, I think a little bit about which is the first Edinburgh newspaper in our plump here from a curious criticus of 1651, 20 years after the Gazette de France. But after the Edinburgh Gazette uh, came out in 1680 and the Edinburgh and Scots Courant, which followed it, there were very many newspapers for sale in Edinburgh. And there was a great uh, desire to ensure that they kept on reporting even after the union of the, uh, uh, of the kingdoms in 1707, European news. In the run up to that union, uh, the Paris Gazette was itself in, produced in an Edinburgh edition in English. Uh, and also the same was true of the Harlem Courant so that major newspapers from France and the Netherlands could be read to put a context on what other people were saying about the Anglo-Scottish Union negotiations and to put those into a European context. And that wasn't lost. As late, uh, uh, 30 years later, when the Scots magazine was founded in 1739, its mission statement was that our readers might have a more impartial view of political disputes that the occurrences of Europe might not be wholly lost. I think we might almost find uh, a Scottish media outlet saying something of the same thing today. And true to its word, uh, the Scots magazine published a French perspective on the Battle of Fontenoy in June 1745, which was, uh, considering the French had won at the last minute through the deployment of the Irish brigades, uh, quite a remarkable thing to do in the context of the fact that Great Britain, the British Empire were at war with France in the War of the Austrian Succession at the time. And these papers, of course, they, uh, many of them are short lives and they didn't have huge circulations, though they probably had quite large circulation through the coffee houses. These papers circulated among uh, the predominantly male world of sociability. And there are interesting similarities between that world too, because an almost exactly similar proportion of Edinburgh and Parisian men are Freemasons uh, in the 18th century. And the interesting thing again in the Edinburgh Masonic lodges, uh, the presence of Bordeaux merchants such as Bartholomew Sanderlands, and also the admission of Scottish officers in the French service from French Freemasonry into Edinburgh lodges. 
while a, a, as a counterpart, Andrew, Ram, Andrew Ramsey uh, became a, a grand master within French masonry and the Lodge of St. Thomas Paris was itself founded in 1726 by Jacobite exiles. These things were more closely linked than we now imagine. And in the same way, some of the features that Scots wanted to see in their own national lives derived from the keenly viewed development of the French Academy and the subsidiary um, subject, uh, subject or topic led academies that developed in its wake in the middle of the 17th century. So Robert Sibbald, uh, who we will see uh, shortly, had quite a connection with France himself, proposed the development of a national Scottish Academy. Uh, it was not to occur for another century. Uh, and various societies, however, such as the Medical Knowledge Society and the Philosophical Society, of course, did develop during the 18th century. But almost uh, another direct import from uh, the France of the Bourbons was the post of historiographer royal, which was instituted in Scotland in 1681, together with the post of geographer royal, which I do not think had a counterpart in France at the time. And there are, of course, those, those posts, of course, are still in existence. So uh, Christopher Smout is the current historiographer royal, and Charles Withers is the current geographer royal. But one of uh, one I think of the most uh, intriguing connections is one uh, is the agricultural one, and gardening may seem quite a marginal topic uh, in terms of the intellectual and political and cultural history of nations. But French, but Scottish gardeners were very much in demand in France in the 17th century for a very simple reason: they could get things to grow where other people couldn't. They had to. There's a nice little manual on how to grow tomatoes against a south-facing wall published by a French gardener in Scotland, a Scottish gardener in Scotland in the late 1680s. And obviously anyone, it's still pretty difficult and it's not the little ice age today, anyone who can grow a tomato against, an, against a, a south-facing wall isn't doing badly in Scotland to this day, take it from me. And Robert Morrison, who later went on uh, to run the infant Kew garden was the gardener or became gardener to the Duc d'Orléans at Blois uh, and the late 1650s and early 1660s. And it was Morrison whom uh, Robert Sibbald and Andrew Bolfer, his friend, discussed the development of, of, of their idea for a physic garden, which underpinned the physic garden which was set up in Edinburgh in 1675, which underpinned the development of the medical school. It's one of the first gardens to institute uh, a, a complex, I mean, herbs had always been used in medicine, but a complex relationship between botany, pharmacy, ph uh, pharmacy and pharmacology and medical training, which became central to uh, the development of botanical and arboreal policy throughout the later British empire. Uh, and in a sense, that itself, that's because it's a long story, but that's because Scotland overproduced doctors and the integration of botanical and arboreal training into the medical curriculum, which was practiced at Edinburgh and then at Glasgow at the gardens at the college at Glasgow too, actually created a unique combination of highly trained, uh, highly trained scientists who also knew a lot about plants. So uh, uh, they, that became very central to the development of botanic gardens all over the British Empire and was itself quite innovative in that it foreshadowed uh, Johann Senckenberg's Temple of Science at Frankfurt, which was almost a century later. And there was, I think, the perfect, uh, a, a perfect conjunction of Scottish, uh, Scottish work on the frontiers, as it were, this time the frontiers of what was possible in gardens, being recognized in France and having the opportunities to develop the ideas and practice which could be repatriated through, gen uh, through innovation to Scotland. Similarly, the Salon first uh, opened at Paris in 1699, which had 60,000 visitors by 1787. The ancestor in, in many ways of modern galleries was followed by the development of the much humbler uh, first gallery in Edinburgh probably by John Scougal, the borough painter in Advocates Close by St. Giles in 1710. I can't go into the details of the art trades, which is fascinating enough between uh, 
France, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, and Scotland. But suffice it to say that in both, both France and Scotland, and probably Scotland taking it taking its lead from France here, portraits became uh, perhaps the the growing importance of portraits and portraiture is itself an avatar of the development of the idea of celebrity, which is possibly a French invention, depending if you believe uh, accept uh, Lilti's conclusions or not in the 18th century. So in a Glasgow, a very early 18th century Glasgow salt market group, an auction, 755 of the 77 consignments were portraits. Uh, and Scotland almost certainly took that from France. But intriguingly, one of the things that's not known very much about, about Scottish music is, uh, uh, or at least it is notionally known by those who work in it, but is not widely recognized, is that so-called traditional Scottish music, what we think of as uh, traditional Scottish music is in fact hybridized between what Scots played before 1700 and French and Italian forms. And that goes on. The, uh, the uh, uh, Marche des Soldats de Robert Bruce, which is of course still played on, on uh, major French military occasions and play, in fact played quite frequently, derives from a Scottish tune, Hey Tutti Tati, but has been, was upgraded uh, by Scots in, the, in a Franco-Italian fashion in the 18th century and has subsequently been rearranged and upgraded again by French composers, which is how it's played today. It, in dancing the assembly, the assemblies, uh, dancing assemblies met in Edinburgh from 1710 onwards, and we are fairly secured of how they were organized from 1723. They were organized in a hybrid, or should we say a divided format of minuets, French style, for French, uh, French dance, generally not too much effort, in which couples participated for four hours or three hours followed by a break for tea, coffee, and chocolate, and Scottish country dances for a further three hours from 8 to 11 p.m. Uh, couples would dance together and sometimes with each other, possibly at the minuets, but the country dances brought the whole dancing hall together. They replaced the individual and relationship, uh, relationship with a communal relationship. And in some ways, people have seen this balance in the Scottish the Edinburgh assemblies of the 18th century between the minuet and the country dance as a balance between uh, intellectual and cosmopolitan formality and the vivacity of a Scottish community spirit. Whether you want to go down that road or not, I leave up to you. But there were personal links involved here too, because Ian Roy Stewart, John Roy Stewart, uh, who fought at Fontenoy with the French forces and later fought in the for the Jacobites in 1745-6. On the occasion of uh, Prince Charles's balls at Holyrood was put in charge of the country dance section. So I can't resist sharing a couple of the dresses, one of which we think we're fairly sure was, was worn at one of the Holyrood balls in 1745. The other quite possibly was. The one on the left has got better provenance, provenance and that comes from uh, Madame Oliphant of Gask, the wife of the Baron Oliphant of Gask, who uh, was herself uh, a cousin of one of, of one of the female directresses of the Dancing Assembly. And the one on the right comes from uh, the Countess uh, with a less good provenance, was supposed to be worn by the Countess of Airlie on the, one of these occasions. To return, uh, to, uh, to return briefly to painting, um, there's a whole story here about the development of genre and historical painting in France uh, and the relationship between Scottish history and French models and the, uh, uh, and the way in which uh, those are represented in the 17th and 18th century. Mary, Queen of Scots, of course, was also Queen of, uh, Queen of France, was first championed as a subject by John Alexander, who, uh, um, who was active in Paris before 1710, before moving to the French Academy at Rome, and then became uh, an art dealer between uh, the continent and Scotland for the Earl of Annandale. Similarly, uh, similarly William Aikman, who is a pupil of the naturalized uh, um, uh, 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 Fleming, John de Medina, became in, in succession to, spent time in France before 1707, 
and became painter to Edinburgh Town Council in succession to John Scougal. And rather interestingly and intriguingly, and there's more French uh, connection than this, but I shall just uh, leave you an anecdote that Alan Ramsey, uh, who of course became court painter to George III, George III went with Alexander Cunningham, uh, to, uh, uh, who was a cousin of uh, the British consul of Livorno, where the Aitman family had uh, their uh, um, a mercantile business through France with a resolution between them to speak only French and from Marseille to Antibes to wear tartan, which they did, uh, symbolizing perhaps those patriotic, ma patriotic mountaineers uh, who were later invoked, of course, by the Nisoir Garibaldi in, uh, the, in the uh, uniform that he gave some of his volunteers, not just his Scottish volunteers, in the reunification of Italy. And also the patronage for art and painting generally, which was carried out for, for the Jacobite court, came very largely through the Edinburgh man, Andrew Lumsden, in fact, himself later a co-founder of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in an age which had forgiven his earlier Jacobite transgressions, who first offered that patronage from Rouen and afterwards from Rome. Commercially, there were also very many connections. 63% in the turn of the 18th century of all French wine landed in Scotland, landed at Leith, the, Edinburgh port, the port of Edinburgh and France supplied one in six ships that was in the port. Scottish merchants were themselves often responsible for these shipments since they, uh, they controlled a significant portion of the trade in Bordeaux. Interestingly, in 1700, France and the Netherlands were Scotland's two largest, ex were also two, Scotland's two largest export markets. And the two largest export markets of Scotland in 2019 are also France and the Netherlands. So perhaps less changes in some ways than one imagines. Uh, there was certainly a ready market for this wine. 16 members of the Edinburgh Society of Captains at one supper got through 30 bottles of claret and six of other wine together with five bottles of rum, uh, a bill for what would be 130 livres in the French money, of the day, French money of the day for drinks, which was almost twice their food bill. But France also supplied an extensive, not only a number of immigrants who come in the 16th century, uh, probably in terms of defending part of the group, the defended of the soldiers and others who came to defend Scotland in the days of the rough wooing in the 1540s and 50s, but subsequently and before 1685 and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, uh, an extensive Huguenot community grew up, including Jap Japaners, papermakers, gilders, clock makers and jewelers, as Sybil said, several manufacturers which we had not before. There were also French teachers and, uh, the, uh, and the teaching of French cooking and French pastry making developed in Edinburgh by the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Rather tellingly, uh, some of the most prominent merchants of this group were naturalized in one of the last acts of passed by the Scottish Parliament as Scottish citizens, only two or three months before there were to be no more Scottish citizens uh, made and uh, only British citizens. I think perhaps that the, uh, the Scottish Parliament did not trust the ensuing government in London to ensure that these very valuable Edinburgh citizens had a right of residence uh, and the ability to remain as citizens in Scotland after 1707. It certainly, uh, it certainly uh, makes you think, doesn't it? So there was also a French congregation ba based, a French Protestant congregation based in Lady Yester's Kirk. The minister's stipend, which was originally set by the Scottish Parliament, was sustained suitably enough by the wine duty, uh, which was overwhelmingly claret coming into the port of Leith. But it was also supported, um, uh, or its charitable works were also supported by bequests and gifts from the citizens of Edinburgh, the non-French citizens of Edinburgh. For example, that of a bequest from William Mitchell uh, a baker in 1693 of the sale of his property to feed the poor of the French Kirk at a time of famine in Scotland, indeed throughout most of Northern Europe. So one area where Scotland uh, was very much uh, uh, a leader and not a, uh, a leader and not a follower was uh, the development of commerce. Um, the Edinburgh, goldsmith, the Edinburgh goldsmiths around St Giles developed a foreign exchange system 
by the mids of the uh, middle of the 17th century and had an extensive business in arbitrage notes where they would fundamentally trade the capital value of the bit of their bill, the, the uplift in the capital value of their bill in a different market against the interest rate they were paying to the holder of that bill. Scotland was almost unique among many uh, uh, European countries in having a minority of its own currency trading with its, its own borders. It had never had enough bullion. And in order to sustain a proper monetary, monetary system and, and exchange system within the country, large amounts of foreign currencies circulated, particularly in the coast boroughs. And uh, these were put on, these were put on um, exchange, uh, exchange rates, which might differ from borough to borough. But the point was that they created a sense of money, not as a thing, not as sterling, not as something real, but actually as um, a dematerialized asset. And a lot of Scottish financial innovation in the 18th century comes from a different understanding of cash, because cash is not cash. It could be from any uh, of many European countries. Interestingly, Edinburgh also, in terms of its statistical measurement of its society, follows Paris in the late practice in the late 17th century by introducing baptism, marriage, and death listings, uh, particularly in the news, uh, most principally in the newspapers. Though it appears, although the, uh, I haven't got absolutely contemporary dates in each case, to have been a rather less violent society with its murder rate, its violent crime death rate in the 1750s, about a tenth of the Paris one a century earlier. Now, I'm very glad that I'm sitting at a remote distance and I'm not glad I would dearly like to be with you all, but this one point I'm glad, and that is that as I move towards the close of this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about John Law, who uh, uh, of course was strongly engaged in the financial life of Paris and indeed France at uh, uh, the Rue Quincampoix, uh, and not more than, uh, I think, one or two kilometers from where you are. Law was, of course, an Edinburgh man, born of a notable family of goldsmiths. His brother, Andrew, who became deacon of the goldsmiths, sailed to New Caledonia, the company of Scotland venture of Darien, on the Pan Isthmus of Panama, and a relative, another relative of his, founded Coots. And whatever the outcome of Law's scheme uh, was, Law's aims were very clear. As he put it, j'avais formé les dessins de, de rétablir la France. His view was, and I have to say in this, certainly modern Anglo-American scholarship agrees with him, though not his, necessarily his system, but agrees with him, that without the kind of advanced access to capital, uh, which the British Empire was developing on the Dutch model, following the creation of the third party tradable bond market in 1692 uh, and other financial instruments, and which led to the 66% of British revenue being used to service the interest on the national debt in the seven, at the opening of the Seven Years' War, ultimately gave um, what John Brewer calls the sinews of power, an advantage to the British Empire as against the, its French counterpart because it was better at raising money. And Law's view was very clearly that France was not good enough at raising money. And an idea he'd first had in Scotland to increase, uh, to increase money velocity by diversifying from a bullion-based economy towards what became a fiat currency, in other words, a modern currency economy, uh, was what he implemented too fast and too irregularly, what he tried to implement as controller general of the French finances. The system, Law's system, was a gigantic option on the investability of the French Empire, having learnt from the Darien scheme that undercapitalization and the lack of ability to project force was fatal to any enterprise. France, unlike Scotland, could project force, but it was undercapitalized. Law's impatience and the conservatism of the French elite undermined uh, the system and therefore the ability of the France's crown to compete. And yet the system is in many respects, the ancestor of the post Bretton Woods financial settlement of 1971 and the final decoupling of uh, uh, the United States from the gold standard, which was the end of a standard produced by another Scottish uh, visitor, important visitor to France who contributed economic ideas this time 
economic ideas to France in response to French thinking. And that was James Stewart. James Stewart, uh, another, uh, Edinburgh, uh, mother, another Edinburgh man, um, indeed met his future wife, Lady Frances Weems in France when he met Lord Elko at Lyon in the late 1730s. And he was created ambassador to France by the Stuart court in 1745. That meant of course, that after 1745, he couldn't come back. In Angoulême in exile, he met uh, Monsieur de la Riviere, the physiocrat, and he developed ideas which derive from physiocrat and mercantilist practice, but which offer perhaps a greater flexibility in their interpretation. So Stuart, among Stuart's pioneering ideas were the development of a plan for introducing a uniformity, a uniform system of weights and measures in 1759, and the idea of, in, uh, of creating a stable international monetary system guaranteed with, via a gold standard, which he developed a few years later. But also, certainly he's, he's credited in Scotland by many in the principles of political economy for introduced in 1767, for introducing under the influence of physiocrats like De La Riviere, the, uh, uh, of what, a version of what became the national champions thesis, which is uh, why you have Renault and the United Kingdom no longer has British Leyland. Now, we're moving to the final chapters of this act, the final chapters, as it were, of, of the struggle between, if you like, old alliance, uh, Scotland and France, and the standoff between Scotland in Britain and France. Uh, on the left is the portrait of Charles Edward Stuart, painted by Alan Ramsay at Holyrood in response to a request by Jan Roy St uh, Stuart in um, 1745. On the right, interestingly, is just for pure interest, the gun emplacement, the site of the gun emplacement commanded by the Scotto-French officer James Grant in the French service to lay siege to Stirling Castle in 1745. And this is a map drawn by another French officer of the Battle of Culloden. Uh, I'm sorry for the relatively poor reproduction of this, but on one side it says, L'Armée Ecossoise and another L'Armée Langloise. This was, as it were, the last struggle for, uh, uh, for a Scoto-French polity as opposed to a British polity. And not that uh, in, there's a good deal to be said about a Stuart restoration and its consequences for France in the 18th century and how it might have changed uh, our, our mutual histories. But one of the things which the uh, which the those who defeated the Jacobite Rising of 1746 were unable to do because the British government got cold feet about it was the mass transplantation of populations, and that had been recommended by uh, Cumberland and his senior serving officers in 1746. But although Cumberland lost political reputation, he didn't lose military reputation, and so he was able to celebrate. St strange celebration, but he was a strange man. This, which is Le Grand Arrangement in Nova Scotia of 1754, uh, 1754 and following, uh, and the expulsion of the French Acadians from Nova Scotia, which was the fulfillment in military strategy of what they'd been able to do in the Highlands um, less than 10 years earlier. If that was a brutal note, it's not the note I shall end on, but instead the sense in which, although lost to any contemporary politics, the historic fable, or rather ahistoric fables of Scottish martial valor, later in the, uh, the, the novels of Walter Scott, certainly as translated by de Faucompre, where the structure of the translation is geared round uh, French rather than Scottish history, but also in the cultus of Ossian, there of course is uh, uh, Ossian receiving the French heroes on the top left uh, uh, and a vision of Ossian on the bottom right. And those paintings, I realized I built a, built a guard as a Dane by Anne-Louis Giraudet and Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang uh, Angra, Ossian's dream of 1813. 
show the way in which, uh, in a very etiolated form, the heroic image of uh, the Scottish mountaineer and its struggle for liberty became a one of the palimpsests on which revolutionary and Bonapartist France drew its own aspirations, hopes, and identities. Well, that was a whistle-stop tour, as we, uh, as we might say. It was uh, a tour de raison, and uh, I realized that I've passed over many things you might have wanted more time on and given less time to some things you think should have deserved more time. So I hope we might be able to catch up with that in the questions. Um, that is all. Thank you very much.